I, I would like you to, to take a poll here. Uh, we have lots of uh, young people attending this meeting and this is uh, Dietrich Schneider. Uh, and I have a poll here to ask people, I'm going to launch here the poll. Uh, can you respond to that? I, I'll, I'll give one minute here for us to, to answer this question. Uh, he's very famous and the, I would like to know whether people know one of his background uh, discovery, whether it's uh, isolation of Pompicol, uh, invention of electrodynography, record of GCAG, or discover of the male Moth macrogromerula complex MCG. We have a huge number of participants here. Uh, 428 at the moment, and the 53 on uh, YouTube. Those on YouTube cannot uh, answer this question, but those that are here can. And the we have about a hundred then now that are already answered this question. And I'll give a little bit more, a few seconds more. All right, I'm going to end the poll now and I'm going to share the results. And you, when you share the results, you are going to see that the, uh, he was the inventor of uh, electron tenography, but many people still Confused his findings with isolation of Bombicol, which was another German scientist, a record of GCAG, and discovery of a male uh, morph microgromerular complex MCG that was done by Jean Hildebrand and Steve Matsumoto. All right, thank you very much for, uh, for doing that, for participating in this poll. And now I would like to uh, ask you one of his closest students, uh, Carl Ernest Kasseling. Uh, he's a uh, one of the pioneers of the field of uh, insect olfaction, and the, including this book here uh, that we have in the lab, and the, we sometimes refer to this book in the lab as the Bible of <laughs> in, uh, recordings for single cell recording, things like that. Uh, so that's uh, Colin S. Castling, and I interview him, and I ask only one question. Can you describe a little bit about your interaction with Dietrich Schneider? Take a listen. Thank you, Walter, for inviting me to talk a bit about Dietrich Schneider, my uh, teacher, whom I met very long ago. I will tell a little bit about him and start uh, reading now. Uh, after three years of military service and four more years as a prisoner in the United States and in England, Dietrich Schneider returned home in 1947. Already two years later, he received his PhD in zoology, botany, and physiology, and became assistant in the Max Planck Institute for Biology in Tübingen. I met him in 1953 when I started studying at the Leibniz College in Tübingen. Schneider gave lectures at this college and offered an experimental workshop in his lab. Here he guided a study of vision in back swimmer insects caught from the institute's pool. This was my first contact with experimental work and finally animated me to study science at the University of Tübingen. One lucky day, Schneider asked me for help in his lab at the Institute. This was a great offer. At that time, he was busy recording the first electro-antennograms from the male silk moss antenna together with Erich Hecker. The chemist, Erich Hecker, from the lab of Adolf Butenand, was searching for the chemical structure of the lockstoff the attractant of the female silk moss Bombyx mori. After detecting the EAG method, it took a few more years until the first responses from single olfactory neurons of insects were recorded. This was managed using the necrophorus beetle, thanks to the patience of Jürgen Böck 
Schneider's first doctoral student. My task in Schneider's Tübingen lab was to study the morphology of the Bombyx antenna. Here he taught the beginner how to properly handle a light microscope and how to stain the antenna sensory neurons with methylene blue. This you will see now. Uh, here you see the sensory neurons inside of antennal branches of Bombix Mori stained in 1956. Thus, during my university studies, I spent much time sitting in the back of Schneider's lab. He patiently answered all the questions of the freshmen in the corner. This way, I enjoyed having the invaluable privilege of a personal teacher. Besides this, during five o'clock tea, I learned a lot about his experiences during World War II in Africa and about his life as a prisoner in the USA since 1943. During the first years, the prisoners were generally, generously allowed to run a camp university, even with books mailed from Germany. Later, they had to pick oranges. After all, in Schneider's lab, I had the unique opportunity to meet several scientists visiting from Tübingen and from abroad, including his good friend and insect peer, Franz Huber. Not to forget, Schneider raised in his lab an entirely different organism, the marine Bryozoan Rugula avicularia. Along the way, he detected the positive and negative phototropical growth of zoids and rhizoids, respectively, of this stock forming animal. John Hildebrand's retrospect presented at the beginning of this symposium proves that Dietrich Schneider is kept in good memory by our scientific community. Schneider's vivid and widespread interest in studying and always deeply admiring nature was most inspiring for me and many others. Personally, I owe him a debt of gratitude of his, for his exact, exceptional and permanent support. Finally, now special thanks to Walter Real for inventing and organizing this unique gathering. Uh, Medical Institute, and they're also a member of the National Academy of Science. Leslie, thank you very much for being here with us today. Okay, um, this is amazing. It's amazing to see everybody. Um, I got distracted from having to give a talk because I'm so immersed in all the data. So today I'm going to present um, on this topic that everybody cares about. Why are mosquitoes so persistent? And I apologize, I'm in New York City, so there'll be lots of ambulances. Um, so this picture is hilarious. There's two, I'm gonna actually move to another room. Okay, right, so. that was embarrassing. Okay, I'm gonna go. Um, so here's something you can buy on um, Amazon, which is uh, people are outside being hunted by mosquitoes. Um, these ridiculous uh, netting suits that cover all aspects of their body. But there is one problem, um, which of course is that their hands are completely exposed. And so um, there is no way for these people to um, escape the persistence of, of mosquito, one of the most sophisticated hunting animals on earth. And so I'm gonna talk about um, unpublished work uh, by an amazing postdoc in the lab, Trevor Sorrells. He is just finishing his training and he will be on the job market this fall. So if you're interested in hiring a really sophisticated yeast systems biologist um, who's turned into um, a systems neuroscientist, uh, please make note of his name. Um, and uh, this work was done in part also 
with uh, two talented lab members, Anjali Pandey, who's now a graduate student at Brandeis, Adriana Rosa, a graduate student in the lab, um, and also our collaborators at Genelia. And so fundamentally, we want to understand how mosquitoes are such effective predators of humans. So I want to pause first to think about predation. So a simple way to be a predator is to be an ambush predator, um, as ticks are. So here's a video of a tick. Its um, job is to climb up onto a tall um, plant or a, a blade of grass and wait for um, mammalian um, prey to, to walk by. So they use um, heat sensors um, as well as CO2 sensors on the tips of their sensory organs, and all they do is wait. So the computation for predation is simple. If you detect carbon dioxide or heat, jump onto your prey. So there's not a lot of sophistication or thought put into it. So let's turn to another kind of predation, which we believe is more similar to the kind of predation that mosquitoes engage in. Um, and that is pursuit predation. And uh, the cheetah is one of the most um, beautiful animals and the best predators on earth uh, doing pursuit. And so the job of a pursuit predator is first to identify the prey, follow it through a very complicated, noisy environmental landscape, and then eat it. And so here's a movie of a cheetah from the BBC. So out in the um, East African uh, plains uh, looking for prey, it spotted it. The prey has now spotted the predator and now there's a chase. Um, throughout the chase, the cheetah has to go through trees and rocks and plants and try to remember what it's doing, that it's chasing um, a little antelope. Um, there's also cars that are running by that will obscure its view, but nevertheless, it remembers throughout this chase, even if there are moments where it can't see the prey, it remembers I'm currently pursuing a gazelle and eating it. And so again, uh, the first thing you have to do is to um, spot the prey. You then have to pursue it in an incredibly noisy sensory environment. So for, if you forget um, 10 seconds after spotting it that the prey exists, you will not be an effective predator. So over many minutes, this cheetah has to remember, I saw prey. And then lastly, it has to know when to persist. So if it loses uh, contact with the prey, the prey hides somehow, is it going to keep looking for it for eight hours or will it give up? And so we believe that mosquitoes use very similar strategies um, for their own pursuit. And so, um, of course, carbon dioxide is a really important cue that, that humans give off that we believe is involved in the initial detection of the prey, just like the cheetah spotting the gazelles um, on the Serengeti. Subsequently, of course, um, humans uh, release odors that attract mosquitoes. We also release body heat um, and we provide um, cues for very strong visual targets. Let me get rid of the floating meeting control. Um, and so the, the questions that mosquitoes um, have to ask is basically from the moment of detecting prey, how long should I keep pursuing the human uh, to, to be an effective predator? And this is especially important for mosquitoes um, because they're really living in a noisy sensory environment. Humans will move around, humans will, there will be gusts of wind, there'll be gusts of citronella candles. So they need to know um, whether to persist or abandon the pursuit. And so here's just an example of why we think that CO2 is probably a key cue for prey detection because animals at rest, mosquitoes like to hang out at the sides of cages. Um, and when you puff them, with um, a large volume of synthetic carbon dioxide, they will get activated and start paying attention to host cues. But a major problem is that in the lab, we don't have any efficient way, at least in my lab, of controlling how much carbon dioxide animals are actually sensing. We put a Drosophila fly pad in, in a box, turn it on, and so the whole box is filled with carbon dioxide. And so it's been difficult to ask, how long does this CO2-induced prey detection persist in the mind of the mosquito? How does it know when to persist or abandon pursuit? Should it last for 30 seconds? That would probably be stupid because the human might be very close or 30 minutes that may also be stupid because the human may have gotten into a car and driven away. And so there is no way up until Trevor came to the lab to really precisely deliver carbon dioxide to mosquitoes. And so he has developed um, optogenetics. This is a, a technique um, that was, um, basically come up, came onto the scene um, 10 or 15 years ago that allows um, uh, ion channels that are sensitive to light to be used to activate neurons. 
And so if we use this elegant system that Chris Potter developed to put CS crimson, which is a version of channel rhodopsin that responds to red light, and we shine red light onto a mosquito, it will have the fictive perception that carbon dioxide um, has arrived in the environment. And so uh, we're about 13 years into our research program in the Voss Hill Lab of building Aedes aegypti into a model organism. And we have relied so much on members of this growing community to build tools. And so, um, so we have developed um, a driver line that expresses QF2, as Chris Potter explained. That allows us to put this transcription factor into all of the sensory neurons on the maxillary palp that express GR3 and that respond to carbon dioxide. We then make a different strain made by Anjali Pandey with Trevor Sorrells in which it's possible to express a, a red protein tagged version of CS crimson. And if you cross these two animals together, the only neurons in this mosquito that will respond to red light are those that express GR3 and that normally respond to carbon dioxide. So in effect, rather than turning on that fly pad and delivering some unknown amount of carbon dioxide, a brief pulse of red light will give the mosquitoes the impression that carbon dioxide um, has just been detected. And so just to confirm that the, our um, channel rhodopsin is actually expressed in the right place, um, at the top left, you see the sensory structures of Aedes aegypti, which are very similar to those in Anopheles gambi that Chris talked about. So we don't see detection of GR3 in the antenna, um, but we see a lot of expression in the maxillary palp as expected. And so when we follow the uh, projections of those neurons to the brain, we find that they innervate um, a large glomerulus called um, glomerulus one, which we know from Meg Younger's work is the glomerulus that responds to carbon dioxide. So now Trevor is set up to ask what happens if you shine red light onto animals expressing channel rhodopsin in these neurons. And so throughout the talk, I'm gonna use this little symbol for a red LED um, as a cartoon for activation of the neurons seconds of stimulation. This is a, just a picture of um, a single animal um, kind of hanging out in a little square imaging chamber um, a few seconds before the light was turned on and then a few seconds after. And so you can see in this merged plot, the animal is, is, has really been activated. And if we look um, at a population of animals pre-light stimulation, post-light stimulation, you can see that the control animals that express the transcription factor in CO2 neurons, they are insensitive to light. If we just have the optogenetic um, CS crimson protein um, not expressed, um, we see no response. But when you put both together, you see a strong induction of velocity. So we know that light will now stimulate locomotor activity. Will this fictive CO2 have any other effects? And I should say that the argument I'm making is that this is the um, effect of prey detection, like the cheetah looking at the horizon and detecting the antelope, that that should trigger some thought pattern, some memory to start chasing. And so Trevor built something called an optomembrane feeder, which um, basically allows mosquitoes to sit in the middle of a large cylinder where um, a light, a bright red light will be turned on and then can offer them um, up here a little tube of warm blood that they can puncture um, and drink blood. And so the question is, will fictive CO2 actually induce blood feeding? And so here's just a zoom in picture. On the left are the control animals and the middle of the control animals. And on the right are the animals that have fictive CO2 being triggered. And so you can see that mosquitoes like to hang out and groom. So these guys are cleaning their legs and their tails. So these animals are ignoring the light they're grooming. These animals that have had the benefit of fictive CO2, you can see that their abdomens are growing. So these animals are engorging on the blood that is just on the other side of the mesh. And so this is a really beautiful demonstration that a pulse of fictive CO2 will convert animals that are just sitting around on a grid grooming into hunters that understand that, uh, that there's been a host queue and they will start drinking. And so this is just the quantification of a larger number of experiments that asks, um, under what circumstances can you get this um, attraction to this, to this grid? And so um, again, in these control conditions, if you have just carbon dioxide, they love carbon dioxide. Um, but if you give nothing or light, nothing happens. 
the other control, also nothing happens without CO2. But in the case where optogenetics is working, you see a huge and indistinguishable response of fictive CO2 to actual CO2. So this is working. Now we want to dive in and really ask how, what happens sort of in the brain um, and the behavior of these animals um, after that moment of prey detection. And to do this, we need to have a higher resolution system where we can deliver not only fictive CO2 with, with red light, but also uh, provide a second host cue, which is heat. And so Trevor took over the many PCR machines in the laboratory where he's able to give a highly precise pulse of heat and a highly precise, uh, precise pulse of light. And so he can now ask what kinds of behaviors are um, elicited um, in a single mosquito in real time. And so collaborating with um, Kristen Branson and Alice Roby and Alan Lee at Genelia using their Java algorithm and the animal part tracker, um, Trevor was able to basically use um, machine learning based uh, behavior tracking and post tracking to define a number of different behaviors. And I'll show three of them here. So flight initiation, walking and probing. Probing of course is that moment where this, um, the prey capture has begun and the animals will start biting. And so he's able to look at different epochs of flight, walk and probing behavior in real time. And so here's just an example of what a whole plate looks like um, as the clock is running. They're hanging out and grooming or doing nothing, uh, waiting for the light to be uh, pulsed on, which will happen at zero seconds. Um, and so now you have a light on and you see um, flight initiation, walking, and then um, in a few seconds, probing begins. And so I think this is an incredible demonstration that um, a really short pulse of red light is able to basically trigger that whole behavioral sequence of taking off in flight, walking, and then approaching a surface um, and probing at it. And so um, this is what we'll look at for the rest of the talk is um, how long is the effect of that initial light pulse active in a, a mosquito that is pursuing prey? I love this uh, video from Perrin Ross that actually shows um, a more realistic version of, of the behavior, not in a PCR machine, but um, a human, uh, human tissue. I don't know if it's a finger or a hand with mosquitoes on the other side probing. So, so this is sort of the last step in the pursuit that happens long after they have detected the prey, which we believe is modeled by carbon dioxide. And so, um, so we know when, we, when, when Trevor looks at these different behaviors of walking, uh, flight initiation or probing, in all of these different genotypes, if only heat is applied, you get sort of modest responses. But when you uh, apply light, only in the case of the animal that has these two transgenes in it, do you get a large increase um, in these different behaviors, walking, flight initiation, and probing. And then when you combine this additional host cue of heat with fictive CO2, only in the case of having the optogenetic activation do you see the really sustained behavior. And so this is just quantified here that looking here at the left at walking and at the right at probing, um, do you see this huge increase in, in walking behavior um, in response to light and probing behavior in response to light that is further potentiated by also having heat because we know that an animal activated by CO2 will become more sensitive to heat. I now want to turn to this question of timing. How long should a mosquito decide to pursue its prey? Should it give up after 30 seconds? That would seem to be a bad strategy uh, because the human may be there, but just more than 30 seconds away. Should it give up? Um, should it keep going for an hour? Would also seem to be not a good strategy because an hour the human may have left or gotten into a car. And so the remarkable thing that Trevor has discovered is that a single brief pulse of fictive CO2 induces an extremely long lasting effect um, on both uh, walking and probing behavior. So this is just a plot after a brief pulse of fictive CO2. You see that walking behavior is elevated at least out to 10 minutes. Probing behavior is elevated at least out to 10 minutes. Um, and that these things are potentiated in the presence of heat. And so this gives us a clue of a pursuit predator has to remember that a prey has been spotted and remain in an elevated state of vigilance and initiate the behaviors it needs to capture the prey. So you might ask, is this specific? So you've turned on a light in these transgenic animals. How do we know that nothing else will induce these behaviors? 
So Trevor noticed that green light is kind of an alarming visual stimulus to mosquitoes. So if he just takes wild type animals and stimulates them with heat, high intensity green light or heat plus high intensity green light, the mosquitoes show a brief startle response, but there is no uh, lasting behavioral response. And that's quantified here. So there's no significant increase in walking or probing over the course of the experiment. So this persistent state that we believe is part of hunting of pursuit predation is not elicited by green light. It is moreover not um, triggered by fictive sweet. And so Veronica Jovey and Zhongyan Gong in the lab made a GR4 driver where we can now put this optogenetic tool into sweet taste neurons and uh, triggering heat or fictive sweet taste or heat plus fictive sweet taste does not elicit um, a persistent state, a long lasting increase in these behaviors. So it isn't just having these optogenetic tools floating around in the mosquito that has the effect. They must be placed into CO2 sensitive neurons, only fictive CO2 and not fictive sweet induces the responses. So how about the selectivity with different um, types of animals? So we know that females that have not had a blood meal are extremely attracted to humans, whereas females that have a blood meal do not hunt humans are not attracted. And males do not blood feed, and so the behavioral response um, is not relevant to them. And so we see here again this extremely persistent state of walking and probing in uh, sugar-fed females that are um, actively interested in hosts, and in blood-fed females that uh, have no interest in hunting humans don't show the persistent state. Males show a transient activation um, by light, um, but there is no persistent state. So there is something about a pursuit predator, she must be female, she must be hungry for blood, males do not do it. So this speaks to this idea that this behavioral sequence and this long lasting persistence um, is directly related to the effectiveness of these animals as pursuit predators. And so this is quantified here. Um, again, only uh, females that are host seeking um, show a response um, in both walking and probing to the light stimulus here. Last year, we published um, a paper where we altered the sexual development of the mosquito brain. This is by Nupun Buzrer and colleagues in the lab. He showed that when he disrupts the master regulator of courtship behavior in Drosophila, disrupts that gene in the mosquito, he is able to elicit novel behaviors in these males. So these males show active attraction to human scent in our laboratory assays. So we might imagine these animals have now been converted. These males have been converted to a sort of a female state of the beginning states of hunting, of pursuit predation. So would these animals show a response to fictive CO2? And remarkably, they do. So if you take um, either, um, either of these different uh, genotypes um, and expose them to these different stimuli, you don't see any response. But if you have a mutant here that has the fictive CO2 in it, you see long lasting um, persistent state of walking and probing. So if you don't have the CS crimson reagent um, in this mutant, it doesn't respond. So without fictive CO2, these animals don't show these hunting states. If you are, um, have one good copy of fruitless, you act like a male, so you don't care about fictive CO2. But if you are a fruitless mutant male, you behave exactly like a female. So fictive CO2 activates a hunting paradigm. And so that's quantified here. So again, you only see an increase um, in walking and probing behavior in these, in these males that effectively have been feminized to be paying attention to human cues. And so mm -hmm. that, um, a really important question is this question of timing. I talked about is 30 seconds enough? Is 60 minutes too long? And so what Trevor did was ask, does it matter what the order of events is? If you apply heat first and then fictive CO2 later, does that work? And the answer is no. So if you provide um, a pulse of heat in advance, there's no meaningful increase of walking or, or heat uh, or, or probing. Um, but if you provide it even 60 seconds in advance, so the animal has a pulse of CO2 60 seconds in advance, um, it still knows to increase its walking and probing time. What if we expand that out? And so if you give these animals uh, four minutes in, in advance of, uh, of being uh, given access to heat, they will show a sustained response um, uh, to 
to this stimuli, suggesting that, that within a four minute window after receiving fictive CO2, these animals are still paying attention to the pursuit of a prey. So the last part of detecting your prey, pursuing it through a noisy uh, sensory landscape is of course capturing it. And so Adriana Rosas working with Trevor Sorrell set up what we call a blood blanket where we can do exactly these experiments in the context of giving them what they want, which is artificial blood. And so you can see here the post tracking superimposed on this animal that has fed. And so what we find is that um, you again have to activate them. You have to have prey detection. If you have prey detection after you give them the warm blood, they don't feed. But if you activate them with CO2, you have many, many of these animals that feed on blood. And here's the key experiment. So if we activate them with this prey detection, fictive CO2, even 14 minutes before we give them the blood, a large fraction of them will uh, feed on the blood. And so this detects, this indicates that the females are opening up a window of at least 14 minutes where they're able to uh, sustain um, the detection and pursuit of the prey um, until they end up in engorgement. And so in the last part of it, we asked what is happening in those last moments before these animals engorge. And so Trevor did this lovely um, ethology, behavioral ethology, to identify four different internal states, resting mosquitoes, mosquitoes who are globally searching, which means they're flying, or locally searching, which means they're flying a lot, um, or they're engorging. And so what he discovered is that we can predict exactly what animals will do. With, with some certainty, we can predict that if you're um, about to engorge subsequently, that you will be largely in a local search state. So you'll be spending most of your time um, not flying, uh, walking and probing. But if you are destined not to feed, you'll be mostly in the global search paradigm. And so this is a great demonstration that not only um, uh, will fictive CO2 actually trigger these long lasting pursuit of human prey, but that if we look in great detail at what the animals are doing, we can predict with some certainty what they will actually do that they will feed or not feed. And so what I've shown you today is that a persistent behavioral state triggered by uh, prey detection, which is CO2, will allow these animals to actually get their prey, which in the case of mosquitoes is humans, and that the persistent state um, is existing somewhere in the brain of these animals. And this is what Trevor will do um, in his own laboratory, is to try to understand what is fictive CO2 doing in the female brain and in the fruitless mutant brain uh, to be able to uh, make them such incredibly effective predators of humans. So I wanna thank my funders and our collaborators and you um, for this amazing day. And I'm really looking forward to questions um, and the rest of the 24 hours. Uh, thank you very much, Leslie. Uh, we shall now move to questions. And we're starting here with a question for, uh, a question for Ahanti. Are these mosquitoes mated? And maybe we can combine also that with anonymous question that is it possible that the males are attractive to humans because of females might be around? Maybe we could address it to question once. Yep, so these are these females are mated. We have and we do a little bit with virgins. Virgins are um, like virgins are a little bit less good at hunting. So we all of these females are mated. So what is the role of males in being attracted to humans? This is this is actually as controversial as DEET. I've been getting a lot of emails from people like they are attracted to humans, they're not attracted to humans. So in the laboratory, we don't find that in our small containers, males are very interested in humans or human sense unless you feminize them and get rid of fruitless. I think it's very plausible that in the wild or in the field or in other contexts that males really like females. And so if you have females, the males will hang out by the females and the females are hanging out with males. So you have humans, female mosquitoes, and then male mosquitoes join the party. Uh, Kelly, what's the question from Greg Pask? Do you have yeah. that question? Um, Greg's question is the persistent hunting state is strongly reminiscent of mating in flies. Do you think that they might be closely related in terms of neurons, circuits, or neurochemistry? That was a that, question from Greg Jefferies. Thank you. That is a great question, Greg. And um, of course, if I had more time, I would do a scholarly introduction of Drosophila courtship behavior. And yes, indeed, there are neurons um, in the male Drosophila brain called the P1 neurons that flip them into an elevated state where they are hunting 
female sexual partners. And so it's exactly, we, we believe it's an exact parallel. So that there must be, um, there must be somewhere in the 80s Egypti brain, either in females or in feminized males, such neurons that are, that are flipped into a state by fit of CO2 or CO2. So I completely agree. We're probably a hundred years behind all the Drosophila scientists in actually answering that question. So it will be very tricky to identify the circuit that, that underlies the persistence, but I have confidence that Trevor will do it. Very good. Monica Stengel uh, from Germany is asking here, are female CO2 receptors non-inactivating as compared to male CO2 receptors after brief natural stimulation of CO2? Meaning, do the CO2 dependent receptor potentials differ between sex in their kinetics? Um, we don't find any behavioral difference in, um, in how males and females are startled by, by carbon dioxide. And I'm not aware of any electrophysiological differences in how they respond. I'm not aware also of anybody who's been able to do the magic that Josefina has done to actually put them into heterologous cells to ask what their actual biophysical properties are. You would need to do that. You need to put it into actual look at the proteins. So we don't know, but there's no, there's no real evidence that the biophysics is different that I'm aware of. Uh, Greg Pask is asking, uh, first of all, he says, thank you for sharing this work. The optogenetic approach to CO2 neuron activation is quite nice. Are there any ways your lab is attempted to represent the different CO2 concentrations as well as the filamentous nature of a CO2 plume? Um, and I think this relates to a question from Carolina Reisenman that I saw of, of have we done red light in free flight? And so we have not. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that that's certainly possible with these sort of engineered solutions where you track a mosquito and then and then hit it with a with a red light in a precise way. We haven't done that. Um, what Trevor did in setting this up is is increasing the amount of stimulation of red light. So absolutely, you get you get a dose dependent response. So the more red light the greater the power of red light, the greater the behavior, which is exactly what's seen for neurophysiological responses of olfactory neurons when you add more actual CO2 or behavior, actual CO2. So we think that the optogenetics faithfully recapitulates um, what CO2 does. I think it's in the same line, the question from Eduardo Hatano. Uh, amazing work. The red light is mimicking the CO2, but can different intensities of the red light be related to different concentration of CO2? If so, what's the equivalent CO2 concentration that was used in the experiments? Impossible to say, but it's a great question. I think that that's, ever since I joined the olfaction community in 1993, this is always the problem. How do you figure out how much um, stimulus is reaching the olfactory neuron? It's, it's an unanswered question, but it's a very good question. Um, if somebody could figure out how we know exactly how many molecules of monomolecular, you know, how much CO2 is hitting those neurons, maybe John Clardy, John Clardy will figure that out, exactly how, how many molecules. Uh, Ahanti is asking, mechanist, mechanistically, how do mosquitoes tell time? How could that time frame of 40 minutes be so consistent? I love this question. And I don't, I mean, I think time the level of timekeeping at the level of 24 hours or, or six months or 12 months is well understood. Timekeeping at the level of of, of 14 or 15 minutes is, is, is much less well understood. I guess there's studies in Drosophila courtship where they're able to, to kind of have a timer that runs for, for 20 minutes, but um, this is gonna come down to really getting into the central brain of the mosquito to figure out what's the mechanism that a neuron is flipped into high activity for, for 14 minutes and then what, what turns it off. That signal of the mosquito saying whatever the human is not here. I'm giving up. You know, what's the, what, what's the abandon all hope signal? So we don't know. And there's this question also, it's anonymous. Uh, do you see age-related changes? We have not tested age-related changes. It's very interesting to ask whether hunting, um, you know, if young females are ineffective hunters, if older females lose the plot. So we haven't looked. Rui Shua is asking, does this apply for gravity females searching for water to lay the eggs? Oh, great. Um, we, this is what Ben Matthews works on in his new lab at the University of British Columbia. And so 
Optogenetics is going to be a great tool for everybody here. So we'll, this paper should be up on BioArchive soon. And so then we'll, we'll send anybody who wants the, the strain to ask that question. But we haven't looked. Right. So how do you uh, um, cope with the so many uh, strains of uh, I guess you can keep that for some time, is it the right eggs? But do you have a space where you store all these this, uh, this lines? It's, it's actually an unanticipated managerial nightmare that, I mean, we have so many strains and um, it's, it's a nightmare and I, I'm not prepared. I mean, people keep generating so many great strains and I just don't know what to do. All right. Thank you very much, Leslie. Uh, we move on to the next presentation. Now we go from New York to New Jersey, very close to each other, uh, from Princeton University. Jessica Zang is here. Uh, to present her work also on mosquitoes. Jessica, it's a great pleasure to have you with us today. Hi. Um, thanks, everyone, for being here. And uh, thanks to the symposium organizers for putting together such a great program. Um, and today I'm going to be telling you about my work on what makes human smell unique and what they can tell us about uh, mosquito evolution. Okay, um, so while many of you probably know that um, even though there are more than 3,000 species of mosquitoes in the world, uh, there's only a small handful of species that are responsible for most of human disease. I also don't think I need to tell this crowd, especially following Leslie, that two of the biggest culprits are these mosquitoes, Anopheles gambii and Aedes aegypti. And um, one of the main reasons why these particular species are such major disease vectors is that uh, they've evolved to live in human habitats, and they've also evolved a very strong preference for humans. So I'm interested in understanding what evolutionary changes underlie this behavioral shift in host preference. Um, so let me focus on Aedes aegypti. Um, so uh, this species is currently distributed worldwide over the tropics and subtropics, uh, but it actually exists in two different subspecies that differ in uh, several ways, uh, morphology, distribution, as you can see, uh, and their behavior. So the generalist uh, form is uh, restricted to sub-Saharan Africa. And then within the last 10,000 years, the specialist form evolved. Um, and in the last 500 years, it's hitched a ride on slave ships and spread around the world uh, via uh, global shipping routes. So if we look at uh, blood meal data from wild caught mosquitoes, uh, you can see that indeed most studies of the human specialist populations uh, do find that uh, uh, the specialist mosquitoes are biting humans. And the few studies we have of generalist populations seem to have uh, broader diets. Uh, uh, we can bring these mosquitoes into the lab and test them in this olfactometer device where mosquitoes are released into a large box and allowed to choose between two hosts. And this difference basically holds if um, in the lab uh, we can see that the specialist mosquitoes in brown here strongly prefer humans while the generalists are a bit more ambivalent. So we know that uh, mosquitoes are using olfactory cues to do this, uh, but this is actually not, not really a trivial problem for the mosquito. Um, there are lots of uh, cues that, that these uh, hosts are releasing, and um, lots of compounds are in common among hosts, and they're also navigating this very complicated olfactory environment. So in this noise, a generalist mosquito needs to do something like this, tune in to just the right cues to target suitable hosts, any vertebrate. Um, and the specialist, on the other hand, needs to tune in on a different set of cues to target its preferred host. But we really don't know uh, what those cues are because no one so far has done a comparative and quantitative study of what all of these different stimuli smell like. So I'm trying to answer two questions. First, how frequently do compounds and their combinations occur in nature? And second, 
what can this, what I call odor space, tell us about the evolution of mosquito host preference? So here's how uh, we actually go about capturing odor. And there are a number of different techniques, but basically they all boil down to passing clean air over an odor stimulus, be it a small animal, a human, um, or just some hair as a proxy for the odor of the entire animal. And we trap the compounds on an absorbent polymer for analysis. Um, in practice, this is what it looks like. Um, visited a lot of different zoos and other places. Um, here's my advisor, Lindy, donating some of her odor. Um, and in the end, we want to end up with a uh, with a data set like this, where we have uh, samples by compounds and the relative abundance of each uh, of each compound in that sample. Okay, so uh, here here's what the data look like, um, and here so each color is a different compound, and the length of the bar shows the relative abundance of each compound in each sample going down the left here. So here are uh, animals in the top and here are other environmental samples that uh, wouldn't really be suitable mosquito hosts. And uh, before I move on, I just wanna take a second to thank our lab tech, Summer Coffee, who's been really instrumental in helping me process some of these samples. Okay, and then we also have multiple, uh, we have samples from multiple individuals uh, for some species. And there's a lot to take in here, but I hope uh, you may already be able to see some patterns. Um, so you can see that a lot of the animals, including humans, are distinguished from stuff like soil and feces uh, by these aldehydes in uh, red, orange, and yellow. And humans are further distinguished from uh, other animals by an unusual abundance of these purple compounds, which are ketones. So we can start uh, pulling out some of these patterns by plotting a PCA. And here I've only chosen a single representative from each species. You can see that uh, the hosts and non-hosts are quite well separated. And again, you can see that these aldehydes are explaining um, a lot of this difference. And so aldehydes might be reasonable indicators of, uh, of a suitable host for a journalist mosquito. Okay, and then here I'm plotting one representative for each um, non-human animal species, uh, as well as individual humans. So again, you can see there's very clear separation in the order profiles, uh, driven by these ketones in purple and one aldehyde in particular, decanel. So just to see all the patterns together, let me replot all the data on a new PCA. Here are the three groups we're interested in, um, humans, non humans, non-human animals, and non-animals. And we'd expect the olfactory systems of generalist mosquitoes to be tuned to discriminate well across PC1, and for specialist mosquitoes to discriminate well across PC2. Um, and so here are the compounds that mosquitoes could be using to do that. Um, and we thought this, this distinctiveness of human odor was especially striking and somewhat surprising to us actually. So I started to dig into the literature to see if there are any clues as to why our odor is so distinct. Um, so it appears to come down to some unique aspects of human skin biochemistry. And so in, in digging into some of this old literature, I found that these three ketones are probably coming from two main sources. Uh, first, acetoin seems to be a bacterial product uh, related to lactic acid metabolism. As you probably know, humans are particularly sweaty animals, so we produce a lot of lactic acid and therefore probably also acetone. Um, and the other two ketones appear to be coming from our sebum or our skin oils. So unlike, other, uh, unlike most other animals, um, humans have a lot of uh, this compound called squalene on our skin. So thought it might have, to have something to do with UV protection, um, possibly because we're, we're hairless. On the other hand, decanel is, comes from this uh, antimicrobial fatty acid called sapienic acid. And so even though sapienic acid is pretty unique to humans, um, lots of other animals also have 
have uh, fatty acids on their skin that break down into aldehydes and other links, as you can see here in this uh, PCA. So it seems like, to sum up, the ketones are reflecting fairly new and unique aspects of human skin biochemistry. But even though uh, decanol is also a pretty good indicator of humans, lots of other animals also have unsaturated fatty acids in their sebum that would break down into these shorter chain aldehydes with similar structures to decanol. Okay, so let me just uh, throw these raw data up again so you can see some of those patterns in the raw data. Um, but uh, really, I want to come back to the original motivating question, which is, uh, which of these cues do human specialist mosquitoes use to talk, target hosts? So one way to begin answering this question is to ask what compounds mosquitoes are most sensitive to. And so my lab mate, Ji Lei Zhao, did a very cool study where he exposed Aedes aegypti mosquitoes to different odors while imaging their antennal lobe activity. Um, and so here, uh, here I'm showing the antennal lobe activity uh, in response to human, rat, or sheep odor. And you can see that one region of the antennal lobe lights up in response to human odor, but not, uh, but not in response to other animals. So Gile found that this glomerulus is, uh, is tuned specifically to longer chain aldehydes like decanel. So it seems like Aedes aegypti mosquitoes might be using decanel to target humans. So for me, this prompts the question, um, why not use the, why, why wouldn't mosquitoes use the ketones? You can see from these data, like just, uh, just very roughly, it seems like ketones should be just as, just as good or maybe even a better indicator of a uh, human host than, than decanol and red. So uh, we have a hypothesis based on what we know about the evolutionary history of these human specialist mosquitoes. And that is that they evolved from generalist ancestors. So here I'm showing compounds um, ordered and colored uh, by uh, how much variation they explain along the axis that separates hosts from, uh, hosts from non-hosts. So as you might expect, most of the compounds have very little discrimin discriminatory power. That's why it's mostly white in the middle. But here on this side in the red, these are the compounds that we'd expect to have, um, well, we'd expect a journalist mosquito to be uh, paying attention to these compounds if it wants to locate vertebrate host. And then we can compare that uh, with the same plot that would be relevant for a specialist mosquito uh, with uh, humans on one side and non-human animals on the other. And decanel, you can see, is the only one that was already, already sort of useful for journalist mosquitoes. So you can imagine it wouldn't be that hard to um, make a small tweak in an existing decanol receptor or maybe even a general aldehyde receptor um, in the ancestor of human specialist mosquitoes that could facilitate uh, this preference for human hosts. So I'm currently uh, working on a, uh, on a model to formalize this hypothesis. Um, but, uh, but I hope that uh, besides the details of um, just this specific story that uh, human specialist mosquitoes might be using decanol in particular, I hope more generally what you'll take away from this talk is that the key insights here depend on uh, understanding uh, both the structure of the olfactory environment that um, these animals are navigating and second, the evolutionary history of uh, their behavioral change. So I'd like to thank many people and organizations uh, for uh, support, funding, and advice. Um, thank you once again to the symposium organizers, and I'll be happy to take questions. Uh, thank you, Jessica. Uh, Kelly, uh, do you have any questions? Um, we do have one question from Josephina, and her question is, have you tried quantitating the odor space of a human before and after the application of DEET or other repellents? Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. We haven't. Um, yeah, I mean, I imagine, I suppose the question could be about, uh, do we think that the um, repellent does anything more than simply adding adding the compound to the odor blend? Um, I'm not sure there's that much evidence that it does. Uh, so um, yeah, I, I think 
I don't know. I think I think existing existing work would suggest that probably any repellents are specifically um, adding extra signals to the odor blend and not probably not changing changing the blend in any substantive way. Uh, there are two questions here. One is anonymous and says, uh, "Do you use nectar for, uh, slash plant for comparison? How these vectors differentiate between energy source and the host?" Then another one. That come, comes from Blanca Popov, and she asked, uh, you mentioned acetone. Are, are there any indications that diabetics are attracted more frequently than health people? Um, okay, so the second question, so there's a slight difference. Acetone, acetone is a different compound from acetoin. Um, it's possible that uh, acetone, acetone uh, the, the simple ketone, uh, that was not the one I had talked about. Um, that one was actually uh, too volatile for us to capture reliably, uh, so it's not included. It could also be um, enriched in human odor, but uh, but we don't know. Um, sorry, the other question was about sorry differentiating nectar blends from from hosts. Could, could you repeat it? Yeah. So that uh, do you see uh, do you use in nectar uh, or plants for comparison? how these vectors differentiate between energy source and the host? Yeah, so um, presumably, uh, I mean, it makes sense that mosquitoes would, would, would need to differentiate between those. Uh, if a mosquito needs uh, protein to lay, uh, to lay eggs, then it should be looking for a host. And it, um, if it needs sugar, then it should be looking for flour or something. Um, and while well, these things obviously smell very different, um, I mean, I think we could probably infer that even without this careful study. Um, but uh, yeah, they, they can almost certainly do so with um, odor, although of course there are many other cues they can use like um, heat, visual appearance. Okay, uh, give, given the large number of participants, uh, uh, over 500, we are, it's impossible for us to go by raise of hand, okay? So uh, please do not use that feature. It's impossible for us to detect that. Please use the question and answers or the chat if you are in the panel. Uh, looks like Professor John Pickett has a question. Uh, yeah, it was just a point of information, Jessica. You should know that uh, we've shown conclusively that uh, some of the compounds that are at higher levels in unattractive people include the most powerful of those. One is sulcatone and the other is geronyl acetone. So usually attractive people have very small amounts, almost negligible amounts. I've just been doing a recent survey of, of, uh, of many hundreds of people. Attractive people have barely got any detectable of those compounds, but the unattractive people have much higher levels. And we can actually use these compounds in a, a contextual repellent uh, formulation on attractive humans. I'll be mentioning this in my contextual talk uh, uh, tomorrow. Thank you very much, John. Iliano is asking, uh, have you considered mosquitoes uh, uh, prefer a specific site on the human, human skin and those sites may release different odorants? Yeah, so um, that's why I thought it was quite interesting to find out about the um, biochemical origins of some of these compounds. Um, I think, well, maybe because of our own noses, we we as humans often focus on like armpits and sweat as the most sweaty part of odor. Um, but uh, if we know that some of these very human specific compounds are coming from sebum, then maybe um, the sites on human skin that are particularly uh, uh, enriched for sebaceous glands, so like our faces and our backs, um, it's possible that um, those areas are, are producing more of these compounds that uh, mosquitoes are paying attention to. Uh, Lisa Baike asks, uh, have you looked at the antenal lobe activation by other blends of variant relative abundance? Um, so Julie's study, um, uh, it's on, it's on BioArchive right now, uh, but uh, yeah, so he looked at uh, a range of, a uh, uh, range of different humans, as well as the odor of a handful of animals. Um, and then he also, uh, he also tried a blend of um, 
a, a simple blend that was meant to mimic the uh, activity evoked by by a human. Uh, Connor, uh, uh, praise your talk, great talk, and yes, uh, could you comment on the role of Latikas across the species in your analysis and whether this was detectable in your GCMS analysis? Yeah, so one, one major caveat of, uh, of this study is that um, acids, particularly lactic acid, require quite different um, analytical methods. So we did not, we weren't able to detect those. Uh, but uh, yeah, we certainly would expect lactic acid to be enriched in humans. Yeah, I think that's the same comment made by Saidi Mohammed uh, with that question. Uh, let's see here, there's some other some other interesting question, but I don't know how much time we have left. Uh, is there a sweet uh, spot of compound ratios that you have seen that impacted the attraction of females to humans? Yeah, so um, uh, we haven't looked, uh, we're, we're only just st starting to, um, uh, to get some behavioral data back, uh, but there is, there is some data that we have that, um, uh, yeah, I guess, so very, it seems like decanol, decanol is certainly a compound that, um, that the mosquitoes are using. Uh, if we have a simple blend of, of decanol and, uh, and, another, and another compound that activates a different glomerulus um, that was activated in the Julia study is attractive to mosquitoes, although we haven't done uh, much work um, trying to vary the, the ratios of those. I think it, Rui has a very interesting question here. Does this microbial bacteria on human and animal skin affect the main compounds? Yeah, so that's interesting um, that um, uh, most of the compounds I talked about, except for acetoin, are, should not be microbiome mediated. So those, uh, those should only be uh, based on uh, sebum production and um, spontaneous reactions with um, ozone on, uh, on our skin. But I think I was, she was interested in the composition, the ratio, if that would I be see. different. I see. Um, yeah, so, uh, so those main compounds I talk about, again, would not be influenced by, um, by the microbiome, uh, because the microbiome has no, has no impact on their production. Uh, but certainly the microbiome could influence other, um, other compounds, like acetone, for instance. We are going to take one more question here. There are many, but uh, uh, it's anonymous questions. At what age stage did you uh, do these assays? Do you see a difference at a different age slash stage? Two minutes remaining. Um, I assume you're talking about the uh, the age of mosquitoes. Yeah, the the the, the, the age of the mosquitoes that they're using. Yeah. So typically, typically we run our behavioral tests around. Um, seven days or so, seven to 14 days or so after eclosion. Um, we haven't done any detailed studies on effective age on attraction to different hosts. And the Marcelo asks, uh, I'd say it's nice talk, Jessica, would you hypothesize that the topical, uh, topically applied compound designed to degrade the decanal mask human pre presence? Yeah, that would, that would certainly be interesting. Um, if it could be done, I don't, I, I don't know if, I don't know if that's that's chemically possible. I'm not, I'm not a chemist, um, uh, but yeah, it, it's certainly interesting to speculate about if there are ways that we can, if we once we know what compounds these are that are uh, playing a role, whether we can do anything about uh, changing their abundance in our skin. Um, Muhammad Haseb uh, asked. How many, how different human odors are related to mosquito attraction and the actual feeding? Did you get that question? It was not very clear to me, to be honest. How different human odors are related to mosquito attraction and actual feeding to the uh, best of your ability? Um, well, we do know that I'm, I'm gonna interpret that question to mean, um, uh, the different stages of, of host seeking. So certainly there are different 
uh, there are different compound cues that are relevant at different um, distances from the hosts. Um, so uh, very close to a host, for instance, uh, so, you know, we'd be using heat. Um, some of these volatile compounds, they uh, may, uh, may diffuse a moderate distance, but probably, probably most of these are relevant sort of like, um, in the, in the mid range, not quite like landing cues when mosquitoes are very close, but um, we expect sort of while mosquitoes are in the area, um, although not necessarily that close to the host yet. Thank you very much, Jessica. Wonderful presentation, lots of interesting questions, but we need to move on. Uh, we appreciate your participation in this symposium. Uh, the next speaker is Ain Saidi, and the, uh, I'm going to share now uh, to uh, ask uh, Karen uh, to be the co-moderator. Uh, she's the co-moderator. She's going to start now on this session with Ain Saidi that I found lost in the list of attendees and I was able to put him back in the panel. So he's here. Karen, uh, thank you for your participation here in this symposium. Well, and thank you, Walter, for inviting me to help out today. So I'm happy to introduce Zane Saeed, who is an assistant professor at Kentucky University and until recently at the Notre Dame University and as a former postdoctoral scholar uh, from Walter's lab at UC Davis. Hi there, can you hear Walter, Karen? Go ahead, go ahead. Great. So what I'll do is uh, I'll try to talk about a couple of aspects that are going in the lab of different projects. Um, so I thought I'd give you an overview in the spirit of the symposium. Um, so flavor of different projects we have been doing. So I thought I'd take different examples uh, from genomes and transcriptomes and some of the protein work. Uh, going on in the lab. Um, thanks to Walter and all the organizers, Coral and uh, uh, Vinan, uh, uh, for this wonderful opportunity. It's great to see all the familiar faces and some new faces. Um, so here I am. So what I've been trying to put this uh, here so I can see you when I'm talking. All right. So first, uh, for the genome part, uh, I'll try to talk about the sand fly uh, we are working in the lab. Uh, so I'll have three parts of the talk. Uh, I'll speak about genomes, then I'll go to transcriptomes, and then they'll end in the proteum. So for each, I'll try to summarize what we did towards the end. So this is a sand fly. This is one of the major pests uh, of uh, multiple diseases. So they're kind of smaller compared to uh, mosquitoes. They're like half the size, half to one third of the size. They transmit this uh, protozoan, which many say protozoan. I'd say uh, largely uh, ignored kind of neglected disease. Uh, there are lots of cases around the world. Uh, interestingly, there is a new world species and there are old world species. So most of the new world species found in America come into the Somaya genera, multiple species here, and old world uh, in the phlebotomy group. So, uh, why, how I got interested in this was the pheromones. So unlike most of the blood feeders we know of, and there's not a very strong pheromone in blood feeding insects, so, but these flies have very decent communication that is based on pheromones. Uh, done by multiple groups, uh, initially by Richard Ward's group and uh, Hamilton group uh, in collaboration with John Pickett, who's here, who's familiar with this work, and my PhD work uh, in Patrick Gurren's lab in Switzerland uh, that identified a range of um, terpenes as um, uh, decent range pheromones. They also, in, the, in songs, so males produce these pheromones and dance around to attract the female. So uh, I thought, wow, now that we have genomes, let's try to see what we can find here. So the pheromone history is, uh, if you take a male, they have this nice glands that are very obvious from the outside, and if you look outside, they have a core. They produce this pheromone that are released outside. Uh, and historically, in Brazil, there are a lot of work showing that there are multiple populations. Uh, they would call one spot. So one of the abdominal segments will have spots. Uh, there were two spots. Two segments will have pair of spots. And there were intermediate. They didn't know what to do. They just called it intermediate. Uh, in this 
later work uh, from mostly uh, Gordon Hamilton's group showed that these populations in Brazil have different types of songs. So there is a one group towards this, you can call it bus types, and then there is another group that it produces these pulses. I have some song clips here if I can play here. So these are like this. You can hear these are the bursts that produce on males when they're also releasing the uh, pheromone to attract the song specifics. Uh, and then there's a different set of populations from different areas, as you can see, that produce these nice pulses. So it's like a very regular pulse. Or sometimes they have pulse and there's a burst in between. So the whole idea here is you have these populations uh, in the new world, in the field itself, mixed baggage kind of mixed out of, uh, so we were trying to look here in the genomic basis, if there is any signature in the genome where we can tell apart the population since it seems to have the songs and the pheromones, so that is an interesting our group. So let's see if we go down. Okay, so. What we did was, uh, we, so this is just to simplify. So this is one place, so raw, that has two populations, uh, one spot and two spots. One produces this burst, and one has this regular pattern. So they're in sympathy, as you can see. And also, interestingly, you can also see some uh, other populations at different locations in Moravia that produce the same bursts, as you can see. And then we took another population from a different place that has a pulses, like you can compare. So they are allopatric here, but they're also insympathetic. So, and each of these, as you can see, has a unique pheromone. So these have sembrine, a token here, and they have germaphrine. So even together, when they're insympathetic, uh, they have two different distinct songs and distinct pheromones. And you are interested to see how these sympathetic populations are similar or different to the allopatric populations that have similar songs uh, and um, uh, pheromones. So this is just a going overview. We have been going around this. So this just escaped from John Carlson, one of the papers to show that uh, flies, just like fruit flies, sand flies seems to have um, very similar apparatus for all fraction, and lots of ORs, ARs, VRs. So this one of the SEM images, scanning electron microscope images of the phlebotomine uh, lutsumaya to show you that they have this regular antenna and have. So one, one of the unique features is they have this nice asteroid since then there's a massive big penicillin content, it's only one segment, and they seem to be responsible for most of the factory capacity we have seen in the slides, from seeing cell recordings and behavior. So what we did, we took the whole, um, uh, so genome is still under process. We annotated first all the OR, TRs, and ARs, uh, and then uh, we took the individual sequencing data that was available uh, from 62 individuals from multiple locations that we just showed you, some of them in sympathetic and olfactory, and we tried to look in the chemosensory genome if there are any signatures by looking at the SNPs or if there is any other possible mechanism. I'll walk into this. So this is the genome that is uh, out there. Uh, it's kind of not in the best shape. So it was four by four then long years ago. Uh, still, they're struggling to put it together. But we took this data, we tried to annotate, we finished annotation of all the ORs, and then we moved from there. So genome, you can access on vector base, what, in whatever shape it is now. So looking at the ORs, we found that there's a massive expansion. It is the old world and new world population. These are ORs, 140 ORs, 88 BRs, and 22 ORs. So it seems those are the most of the applied species, must have domestica here and mosquito species here. And then if you look at this, this was very interesting to us. So there was one unique cluster of almost 140 ORs that seems to be uniquely expanded in the sand flies. So within the sand flies, you can see this old world, there's a blue unique expansion of the clusters, and there's also in old world is the unique expansion of clusters. Taken together, this cluster seems to be uniquely expanded among the flies to be in the sand flies. So that was also very interesting for us. Uh, if you just look at uh, closely, just to expose you, we just our code, just with the roots, but we also see this unique expansion. And we're also interested if there are any group of receptors that secret MLD that is known in fruit flies uh, as a pharma related detection of ours. So we're very interested to see if there are not plus there. So what we did next was, okay, we found a bunch of ORs, GRs and ARs. Uh, we tried to see, okay, take individual bulk of individuals from each location and try to see if there's any signatures in the SNPs uh, in the genome of this chemosensory genome of these slides. 
So these are the four locations. Uh, and first thing we found out, looking at the SNPs, that just looking at the phylogenetic really, that we can broadly, so this is purely based on the genome and free genome. We found that we can divide them into first types and pulse types, uh, all the individuals from these four populations. Next interesting aspect was that since we knew the pheromone, we tried to see if we can somehow take the SNPs and part them in a kind of principal component way, if we can separate these individuals into different constituents. So we saw that we can neatly separate them based on what pheromones they produce. So songs, and here you see the pheromones. So next we are curious, what are the genes? What are the components that are really pulling these clusters apart? As Jessica showed here, we took a different approach. Uh, there is a French group that came up with this PC adapt approach where you can uh, take all the SNPs and see which SNPs are most significant in pulling these clusters away. So here, just a simplistical representation here is that in PC1 here, if you had to see the population that is separating this two pheromone producing population from this, we, can, we found that the three genes are massively contributing to this segregation. Uh, and so on. So you can see that whatever interest you have, population, you can see there are some potential candidates that might be involved in either host or may or together seeking our separation. So next, uh, one of the interesting thing was they have this 100, uh, 200 plus genes, but a lot of only, when you try to look at this SNP analysis, we only found like 50 genes that are present in all the individuals. A lot of them seems to be uniquely expanded or lost. There's a massive loss and gain uh, in this uh, genome. So just by visualizing, we found out that, yeah, some of them have like two copies. Just by looking at this visualizing the context here, and then you see some of them are lost. So we tried to look a normalized depth. It is a normalized depth, and we found that, yeah, most of them have a single copy. You can see different pheromone producing populations. A normal depth too means they have two copies. Uh, of, uh, of, the, of the gene. And then we try to see what's the common denominator. So if there's any common genes that are on all the pheromone producing populations, we are also unique candidates for each pheromone and we did find a unique signature. So we just gain overviews how many were absent, just the pure numbers divided are represented in the types of pheromones they're producing, single copy and the duplicated genes. Next, we were, since there's a massive number of copy number variation, we tried to see, the, let's take the copy number, we have a normalized depth, and then we try to look at the expanded or absent. So here, this was really interesting to us. This is the copy number, zero is complete lost, and six is almost three copies of the gene, two is a single copy of homozygous. So what you see is that we can cluster the populations here, three big clusters based on pheromones, and these are three OR families, VR families, and IR families. So what you also see is that there's a massive um, um, uh, variation in the OR family since it's highly evolving or rapidly evolving, as we all know, and not so much in VR, the least changes for on IRs. So we could get an overview of the chemosensor gene families, how they're behaving in these populations, and also that based on the variation in the numbers of genes, we can also separate them into different clusters. So just taking this data, we again try to see if we can divide into principal components. And yes, that was um, uh, very uh, exciting that we can indeed cluster them based on the copy numbers as we could do in the SNPs. So the summary here from the genome work is this, yes, the genome does provide some insights into the communication and songs. Uh, and then uh, this was interesting because it's not only the SNPs in the chemosensor genome, but also looking at the massive variation gain and loss that we can also gain insights into how the communication is rapidly evolving within these populations. So that was the same fly work uh, going into the transcriptome here. This is one of the interesting slides. It says two home fly, and you probably never heard of it. Uh, it's not for the uh, some of the unique features I walked you through. And this is the SEM image of the uh, female. So it does have all factors and similar. You can see different types. As we know, basic clinics are mostly gene orders, and serotonics are, are mostly polar compounds and tripartite environments. Uh, you can see in the. So, this is if you have heard of single uh, sterile insect technique, this technique was developed in this insect. In this really small, shabby facility, this is in Kerwin, Texas, and I'm visiting it with the picture to show where it was developed. So, it's the most successful genetic manipulation, as we know. Uh, in the insect world, where they eradicated this fly from the mainland uh, in America, from the North America. So it's still a problem in the South. And so every day, 
they make like 600,000 million flights they generate at the border uh, connecting North and South America here in Panama. And they release these massive numbers. And there's no way to separate males and females. They only need Israeli males so that they can go and um, um, reduce the population. So one of the objectives of this long project uh, before I joined in was if we can have some specific attractants for males or females where we can separate uh, the attract or exclude them based on the sex. So we thought, okay, let's try this. So first we took the whole genome of this slide. We annotated, as if you have known to annotations, how painful and meticulous it is because the pipelines don't do much. So you manually have to annotate all the genes. Uh, and then we took the antenna transcriptome because the idea here was if we can find some signatures in the antenna to see male and female baits, maybe we can exclude or attract selectively male for female. And we did the differential expression analysis. So when we did the annotations, what we found out that there are at least a couple of copies in the pheromone-related um, receptor or C67D clusters that we are really interested in. Um, and then we also found that there are multiple ORs at a very different expression level, as you can see, which is like 10 folds, but also that there are some really female specific or female enriched versus female enriched. So next was we found if there is also signature in the column signal. So this is the hydrocarbon from males and females. What it tells you is that males seem to have lots of chemicals in their, on their body, hydrocarbons and massive amounts of compounds. Um, Virgin and mated, and behavior sometimes are more than females. So there is some signatures, it seems, in the communication between males and females, uh, and it seems to vary between mated and unmated. You can visualize in the principal component to see that virgins and males and females are very different, but once they mate, the differentiation goes a little bit away. So this is the differential expression. So we can't bring this slide. So we went to Panama, collected the antenna, uh, extracted the uh, RNA, made the signal in target here, and looked at the transcription. What we found was that yes, there are some specific genes that seems to be highly enriched uh, in males and some in the females. So we can also nicely separate from the PCA. And this is just three candidates we confirm uh, with the TPPR in the lab. And we also express, we have the flies now that are expressing female enriched and male enriched candidates. So we can blast them with female and, and male specific orders so we can identify the potential specific base. So the idea was this, yes, transcriptome does offer some advantages, uh, and then that match of the differential expression also matches with the symmetry of the signals. So that was the transcriptome. The last part is proteum. The, most of the work is published, so the references are there. So this, uh, so we all are familiar that they're very uh, rhythmic. Most of the mosquitoes are very rhythmic, and there's an olfactory system you've seen it a thousand times, just to show you some nice pictures from the lab. Uh, and then uh, we all know that, um, uh, Mosquitoes are very specific when they bite you. So there's a specific time of day around the uh, dusk when they have become active. So here we want to see we collected the RNA every four hours and matched with the behavior and physiology to see if the transcriptome does change over 24 hours and if it translates to protein and if that translates to behavior and physiology. So this is one of the data. It is um, just to show you that most of the uh, so this is every four hour collection, and what we see is higher and lower expression. And first, one of the candidates we're interested in is ARCO. It didn't seem to be very different, but still there were some differences here. And this one of the OBTs that seems to be really a rhythmic, as you can see. If you have continuous dark, we found that the difference is not so dramatic, and so it seems it's skewed by the, the, the light outside. Um, so this is, we got some antibody thanks to uh, Larry Zweibels. Uh, so Larry uh, gave some of the antibody for ARCO. We did this western bot to show that there was not much difference. But we have now data in the lab with RNA-seq that seems to be uh, rhythmic. So this was microarrays in a couple of years ago. So we followed it up with the proteins. We took the 2010, we just smashed them and digested them in the tryptin and tried to see uh, single ion uh, looking at single mm -hmm. uh, peptides to see if they have any rhythmicity. And this is the data that's RNA in the blue, in the red is in the protein. We did find that within 24 hours, they can really cycle the transcripts, not only the transcripts, but followed by the change in the protein. So it seems to be like four to six hours lag between these two peaks, but with a perfect cyclicity for most of the chemosynthesis we found. Um, this was the physiology. We had a, I had a really good undergrad in the lab who would come and record physiology at every four hour uh, during the light and dark phase. What she found was the same stimulus is much more sensitive uh, in the night than it is in the daytime. So that's further evidence that transcripts not only translate 
to proteins, but also you can quantify and measure them in the protein. So as you can see, most of the compounds um, uh, we are familiar now, the mostly involved in human uh, attraction. Uh, and then one of the interesting things we skip here, I'll, I'll go to the next for the first few time. So the whole take home message here is there's a massive modulation. I think almost 30% of the transcriptome was rhythmic in the antenna of the Anopheles gambi, uh, and then protein seems to follow the suit. And then we have this kind of, uh, now that we become victim of ourselves, now we're so careful when we do the experiment, when we do the behavior, when we do the physiology. So yeah, so we just got into this work and uh, we are happy that we are able to see this and report. So that should be my talk. Uh, and I uh, obviously it all came from multiple lab folks uh, who are in the lab. Uh, these two guys are about to join um, uh, from France and they're ready for the visa and multiple collaborators over the years who have had this and the funding from multiple agencies. So thank you so much and I'm open for questions. Uh, thank you, Zane. Uh, uh, sure. Let's see here, we finished just a moment early. Um, I don't see any questions quite yet. I was gonna ask um, if you have an idea, so you know, it's really interesting that you see this cycling of protein levels, especially for OBPs. Do you have an idea of where they're expressed? Like, is it that they're being expressed in novel sites that they're not normally expressed? Or is it in the same, say, sensillum, but just more or less um, like levels of the same protein in the same place? I wish, I wish I knew that I could dissect the sensilla and tell you exactly what's happening, <laughs> but we don't know. One of the interesting things I didn't show here was uh, we did test this EAG uh, uh, response, antenna response, uh, also at different times. And when we test in acids, carboxylic acids, which don't necessarily need the binding protein, uh, the response was not changing uh, any part of the day. Mm. So that was kind of um, very gratifying for us because this OBP field, as Walter can assert here, uh, that you know, it evolves and evolves and evolves, it goes on in cycles. What exactly are OBPs started in the protein era when we can just take the protein, it was so clean, there were one or two proteins and there were parts of work then. Uh, but then once we have genome, we have these 50, 500 candidates, you know, similar sequence, are they still OBP? We call them OBP because of the sequence. So it's kind of, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I wish I knew that. Uh, probably would not someday. Uh, some groups, I think, uh, uh, in San Diego, they had this BSP attached uh, uh, binding protein. So mm -hmm. they can monitor the fluorescence real time. Uh, um, how long did that? They only used it to see the half-life of some of the proteins, but not specifically all factory proteins. But yeah, there might be some tools probably we can measure live in vivo. And then we have a question now from Monica Stankel. Yeah. Did you find circadian changes in adenyl cyclase or in phospholipase C in the antenna? I don't know. Um, uh, so Monica, I'll send you the website. So we created a website when I was in Notre Dame. So you can uh, plug in any gene uh, and then see the cyclicity. So I don't remember. Also, the paper also does describe, but I don't remember. I was so focused on this OR at the time and OBPs. Uh, but there is a website you can plug in any gene and see. So we did for anophylline, and then uh, there is some work done by a different group uh, from uh, Notre Dame uh, on ADIS. Uh, so for ADIS, also you can plug in your gene of interest and see the cyclicity. Mm -hmm. And another question now from Denise Diaz. Congratulations mm -hmm. on your presentation. My question is about the number of copies of each odorant receptor. Mm -hmm. If this fact is related to the, if this fact is related to the evolution of the species complex. Yeah, it looks like. Um, um, so we also did some work. Um, we are still doing just about to finish uh, on old life, uh, old world populations, which you think are more ancient, and there uh, the differences are not huge. Uh, so. Um, here, like only 50 um, genes were like present in most of the individuals. Uh, there, it's almost 170 that are present. Only a small number are um, losses and gains. So it looks like, yes, it does um, depend on how rapidly you are evolving. And it seems it's more reinforced um, from, of course, Denise group and other group, Alex Pichero's work, where they're in sympathy versus neuropathy, there seems to be a different effect. So there is much more, um, Types uh, separation when they're in sympathetic compared to the factors that was used to us. 
So yes, um, uh, being together among this uh, massive numbers and uh, uh, your competitors and related uh, species are related uh, genera, I think it does add enough pressure and families that are really rapidly evolving like ORs as we have seen, seem to be very vulnerable or it's kind of an adaptive mechanism actually to, 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 to indulge in this associative mating and so on. Thank you. Um, let's see. I don't see another question at the moment. People, you can, of course, um, submit your questions via the Q&A. I was going to ask, because I know there's been obviously work on Drosophila antenna and circadian patterns of expression. Have you tried to sort of cross-reference what's changing in mosquitoes with what's changing in Drosophila to see if there's sort of some common, I don't know, themes or sort of types of, of proteins that are changing uh, that aren't maybe particularly odor-specific, but more sort of general? Um, across the time. Are you? I don't know. I'm not aware of any specific work. Uh, there's a paper in Jane Neuroscience, I think, that came out um, looking at, as one part of it, it was looking at circadian effects uh -huh, on, uh -huh. in Drosophila. Yeah, uh, here we were kind of just beat it down to the depths. You know, we had light, light, and light, dark, uh, and then we did every four hours, and we did so many conditions. So uh, I wanted to do flies, but I thought. <laughs> I really have to do it really meticulously. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so you know, I haven't um, um, brought me into that, but that's one of the, yeah, I, I would love to see if there are, uh, I mean, are, are there similar orthologs or also if there are different orthologs and what does it even mean? Um, uh, so looking at the, we, we do study circadian behavior of flies in the lab and they're, they're highly circadian as we all know in the field. Uh, so especially we are working on this Suzuki fly, uh, the Sophila Suzuki that seems to have somewhat different patterns of circadian biology. Mm -hmm. So we are interested and yeah, if you have some money, sometimes we'll do it. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, so you can imagine that it might change depending on their behaviors at different times of day as well. Yeah, but behavior we have done, right? Um, so I have done uh, how, they, how the gravids and origins change massive. I mean, like more than half of the transcriptome of the antenna transcriptome is under the regulation of the, if you are hungry, uh, if you are gravid versus if you are virgin. Um, massive modulations in Suzuki, not so much in Melangaster, or at least, in fact, we didn't find, there's only one OR7, I think, uh, that was slightly upregulated when a fly becomes gravity in Melangaster. Okay. Hey, don't pick it, I can't hear you. Sorry, Zain, nice it's talk. Done. If there's no other earlier career scientist, may I just uh, offer something? Zane, you, you kindly mentioned my role in identifying the Luxomia longipalpis uh, pheromones. The, uh, they, they are very, very different from each other, even though they're only regional differences. I mean, mm -hmm. one's got a hematulane skeleton and one's got a germacrane skeleton, but they're both homoterpenes oh, with extra methyls. And then the sobraline is actually a diterpene mm -hmm. with a strange cyclization. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, that that's we're actually mining the genome of Lutzemeyer at the uh, Longipalpus at the moment to find genes for synthesis, to try and make a, a cheaper synthesis, because uh, that's really what we need for controlling the, uh, these, these uh, pathogen vectors. But what, what's it like with regard to the song? Uh, are they kind of relatively trivial uh, genetic differences, or are you expecting something more fundamental there as well? So, um... So uh, it was completely accidental when we started working on it. I had no idea that I would indulge songs. I mean, I was more interested in pheromones, but you get these two big clusters, and wow, there has to be something. So we didn't do much for the paper, but for the subsequent old world species we are working on. So we took the period gene that affects the song as we know. So, and now we have more understanding now that it seems to be more robust, uh, but it's very preliminary. I can't now because we're still doing the analysis. We only have like 18 individuals from the old world three places. So I wish we had uh, done in what we did for this Maya, which we can because we have the genome and we put together, we integrated the whole full length sequence now. So I will let you know the moment I know. Yeah, I'm most interested. Thank you very much. Sure, anytime. Okay, so if there are no further questions. Oh, no, there's a few, been, a few more questions have come in. Okay, um, from Eduardo Hatano. 
are there any anatomical differences between the different populations of sand flies? I don't know. My friend Carolina uh, 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 Spiegel, she tells me they're not significant, at least at a cursory glance, uh, but I can't discount. I haven't looked into it. Mm -hmm. And then from Molly Scheel, great yes. talk. What degree of sex separation will you be able to achieve with the baits? Do you think it could be a standalone technique? That's what we want, <laughs> so I don't know how much it would be. Uh, so the, the chemistry looks very, very different. Um, that was nice because we were also obviously looking at the chemistries, uh, if there are any uh, sex specific signatures, uh, and they do seem to be some compounds uh, that we probably can apply. And also the idea here is that since we have these slides that are expressing this male enriched 67 D related receptors, so we are running them now on the GC single cell uh, using John Falcon's uh, the halo line. So we have this now. So the idea is that we might hit some unique compounds um, from the hydrocarbons of male calcineas. Uh, since we have this receptor um, like water is to follow reverse chemical ecology, that we have the receptors that are male enriched and female enriched, and yeah. we have the extracts that are strong male and female. So probably will be leading into looking at a very specific and robust group. Thanks, Molly. Okay, and from Thomas Grober, concerning the sandfly songs, can they be used for trapping? Thomas, hi there. <laughs> so yes, uh, I think so. So uh, 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 Laura Harrington's lab uh, in Cornell. So Laura showed that uh, at least in mosquitoes, uh, you can have uh, somewhat effective tracks um, based on sound. Uh, so sand flies, uh, I don't think anyone has seen it systematically, uh, but uh, I don't, um, I, I would not discount that because it looks like there's a robust genetic signature for those songs within populations. Um, so either on their own or in combination um, uh, with uh, pheromones, uh, probably there would be um, highly selective kind of positive meeting strategies you can exploit. Five minutes in. Okay, one, one additional question from Denise Diaz. Did you um, find OBP sequences in the genome that you're examining? Uh, we did not, unfortunately. So it's for you, Denise. You're supposed to do that, I thought. <laughs> so that's for you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we, we would love to do that at some point. Um, but yeah, we, we, we just got into this uh, chemosensory business for very selfish reasons. Uh, uh, but yeah, we would love to hear from you. 